Good morning, East Farmwood. God bless you. We pray that you all are doing well this morning. We come to you in the name of Jesus to share with you the goodness of the Lord and his word. We take it uh, very seriously that this hour is an hour of power from heaven, truth revealed to us on the earth. If you will, can we pray? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your word that gives us strength in our lives to maintain and to obtain. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that this word will be a word that's well understood. This word today will be a word that's timely and relevant. I pray, Father, that you would tie in your scriptures and weave them together in our hearts and our minds in such a way that we can walk away with a complete pattern of understanding and revelation. Father God, we need you in this hour. In this day and time we're living in, there are many things that the enemy has presented before your people to try to block them from going forward in your name. I pray, Father, that every stronghold will be cast down. I pray that every lie that was spoken or any deception that was released by the enemy into anyone's life that should hear this word, I pray that you will drive it out. I pray that you will take a hold of my spirit and my mind and bless me, God, to be a blessing to everybody that view this. Father, if they are feeling down, if they are feeling worn out, if they're feeling misunderstood or if they're just feeling like they just don't please you or don't fit in your kingdom. Father, what I ask you to do today is whatever you have to, whether you have to grease us or whether you have to mold us or shape us, fit us into the spot of the kingdom that you have prepared for us before the foundation of the world. There's somebody, Lord God, that may need you for one thing and another for another, but we all need you, God. So I'm asking you in Jesus' name to take hold of this service and to carry it in the direction you, which you want it to go. I give you honor and I give you praise. And we thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. When you get your Bibles, I want you to just take your Bible and say, this is my word that God has given me in order for me to be able to obtain victory and to receive every promise that God made in Jesus' name. Let's go straight to the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 and let's read two verses for our text out. Hebrews 11 and verse 5 and it reads by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found and the reason for this the scripture said is because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now the scripture in verse number six, I would like to share with you that it simply says it this way. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. I wanna read that one more time. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, to please him. What you're talking about is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I want to I want to carry you in a subject matter this morning based off of Enoch's faith. We want to look at what Enoch had that we want to obtain if we don't already have it or we want to maintain it if we do. I want to talk to you from a subject, standardized faith. Standardized faith. It's here in Hebrews that we find that the author, which has been credited to be Paul, some have said Luke, but more believe it's Paul because he's writing back to his own people, the Jews, and whoever the writer is, is trying to convince the Jews of the new era of faith. And the new era of faith was not of the Old Testament that he was speaking of only. He was using the Old Testament and all of the patriarchs from the old to establish that they had to walk in their season and in their time in a faith that was not something that was already 
uh, let's say, already established as being proven uh, to them. They were in the proving process, okay? So we need to look at the fact that they were walking, not by what they knew, but they were walking by that which they believed, not that what they saw, but that which they believed and what they heard from God and what God impressed. And a lot of times people uh, are confused about the voice of God. And I used to ask God all the time, I said, God, people say they hear your voice. I want to hear your voice. A lot of times God's voice is not like you would think. Uh, and he speaks in many different ways. Uh, Sometimes God's voice is audible enough that you hear it like somebody's talking to you. And you're looking around and you know nobody's there. And you know it's got to be God because of the things that are said to you. And then there's other times God speaks to you in dreams. And in a dream, God will give you things. And you can obtain faith through that dream. There are also, and this is just a few of many, but there's also another way that God can speak to you, and it's like an impression upon your spirit. You feel this impression of, to do or to investigate or, or to trust or to take steps, uh, whatever the case may be. You feel this impression upon you. Nobody told you. You didn't see it written in the sky. But you feel led that this is what God is saying. It's that type of faith that God needs us to have first and foremost so that whenever he introduced anything new to us, we won't be one of those that will be so quick to reject it, but that we will examine it. And I found out the scripture tell us to prove all things. And once it's been proven, hold fast to that which is good. So standardized faith, I wanna, I wanna, wanna explain it as I go, but let's just, let's just read something about Enoch. Enoch it's something about his life that intrigued me when I, I, I have read Hebrews 11 and 6 countless times, but without faith it is impossible to please him. I'm talking about God, for he, come, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I've heard the scripture a lot and I've used it, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But, but, but verse number 6 is in reference to verse number 5, or by verse number 5 we acquire verse number six. And verse number five is speaking about one patriarch in particular. Now, now, if you read uh, the first, uh, uh, for the fourth verse, you'll see that it talks about Abel. And it talks about Cain. Unto God. Abel offered a good uh, sacrifice unto God, a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. This is important that we do better than mine, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. In other words, he never said anything, and we'll talk about that later, but his works spoke for him. In other words, your works will speak for you. He operated by faith. He could not see God, but he offered to the one who he couldn't see, and he gave him the best that he had. Are uh, you listening? And God testifying of his gifts, the scripture said, and by it he being dead yet speaking. In other words, Abel had a testimony that came from God. God did the witnessing to the gift that he had offered. And God spoke for him both living and when he died. So the scripture goes on to tell us now, after he tells us about Abel's righteousness, he talks about Enoch. And you have to understand, as the, as the author is writing, he's not flowing away from, but he's flowing more into the understanding of what righteousness and faith has to offer to you and to me, and it also has to offer to God. It says by faith, again, as we read our text, Enoch, it talks about Enoch was translated, and translated means transposed. Transposed is simply uh, when, when two things, uh, are like one of which is put in place of the other meaning that Enoch took the place of somewhere else or someone else or something else. He moved from where he was and he was a replacement for whatever was in the place that he was in or was not in. He became, in other words, to simplify that, he became transposed from one area to another area. It's almost like when you get the word transit. Trans means to move. 
So when he was translated, he was moved from where he was and he was now in a new place of his own. And this new place that he was in was a place that nobody could see him anymore. I want to say this. A lot of people don't believe in the rapture. And that's up for you for arguments if you feel that it's not so. That's left up to you. I choose to accept it because of this reason. Because if Philip in the book of Acts was ministering in one place and then just like that, he was translated from where he was to another place. If Elijah was standing there with Elisha and snap of the finger, a chariot of fire came along and, and swept him up out of the presence of Elisha. And if Enoch was walking with God and one day they looked for Enoch and Enoch wasn't there anymore, he was just like that gone. I choose to believe that God can and I choose to believe that if he did it before, he'll do it again. That when God get ready for his people to be translated, as long as we continue our walk with him, I believe that one day we will be here and then the next second we will be gone. Let me take you to Genesis chapter 5 when we look in the lineage of Enoch or how he come about in his genealogy of his family. Let's look at verse number 21, Genesis 5 and 21. The Bible said that Enoch lived 60 and 5 years. 60 and 5 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. Now that gives us a little history on Enoch. We understand that he was 65 years old before he had his first child. But the blessing keeps coming as you listen to Enoch testimony. Verse number 23 said, And all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God. Listen, 365 rings a bell to me because we understand that the children of Israel had to travel 40 years on a quest that could have taken them to take the land 40 days. They spied the land for 40 days. They come back with, without a good report, a good report of faith to believe that God was able to reward them if they would just diligently seek his will on how to obtain the land and how to get the victory over the giants that were present. They chose not to believe. Therefore, they did not please God. And God wasn't pleased because he could not. This is what keeps God from being pleased is that he cannot get his will done and his plan that he has for you. And we know that God's plans for us, according to Jeremiah 29 and 11, he said that he knows his thoughts toward us, they're good, and they're not even to give us an expected end. So therefore, it is uh, grievous to God that he can't do what he's trying to do, and he see us doing what we don't need to do, and we're harming ourselves and cutting our own days and blessings off. So Enoch, said all the days of his life were 365. And I said that about the children of Israel in those 40 days that they spied the land. Because they doubted God, it was that generation for 40 years. For 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness. We're gonna, that, you're going to hear that word wandering again. You're going to hear the word again about the children of Israel and what they did and how it didn't please God. But I just wanted to say to you right here at this spot is that I believe God gave instead of years of wandering as he did the children of Israel for however many days of that year that they doubted, that they brought an evil report. I believe in this case, God flipped the script for Enoch and out of his year that he walked with God, the 365 days that he walked with God in his first year of walking with him, he must have walked with him in a right kind of way. He had to walk with him in a year that was faithful and that was righteous. And I believe the same God that did that with the children of Israel, he had to do that with them because it signified the days that they didn't please him. And he gave them 40 years. And I believe he did that because he had did this with Enoch. Is that out of 365 days in a year, 
which makes us a full circle around the sun. It's a full, full year. It's all four seasons. I believe that in every season, Enoch walked with God in such a way that he planted a seed for his eternity and for his life on earth and life in heaven. And the Bible says that he lived a whole 365 years, but watch this, but he didn't die, which means that he lived on earth. God on the earth that he walked with God in the presence of God on the earth. He walked with God, but he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. He had a lot of people around him. There were some people around Enoch, but he walked with God. It was a lot of things probably said around Enoch, but he walked with God. I'm sure some things come along Enoch way in a year's time. And you know, a lot of stuff had happened since this time last year. And, 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 and a lot of things were, were, were sent by the enemy, or let me just say, were, were, were uh, taken by the enemy as an advantage to try to get a disadvantage over you. Uh, and, and, and in that year's time, you had to struggle. Sometimes you, you had to cry. Sometimes you had to start over. Sometimes you had to repent. Whatever the case was, you had to do it if you were going to keep walking with God. Some of you listening to me right now, you probably was one of those that I'm talking about that your year was full of transitions. And the transition wasn't always beautiful. And even in this year, it hadn't always been calm seas. And, 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 and lying down in green pastures. Sometimes you had to run from one pasture until the other gate and wait for God to open the gate for you to come into another pasture. But the thing about it is, is that if you keep walking with him, he's a good shepherd and he will lead you and guide you into all truth through his Holy Spirit. Therefore, I believe that God gave, I said all that to say this, that God gave Enoch a year for every day of the year that he walked with him. And pleased him. Verse 24 said it this way, and Enoch walked with God. See, they, we, we need to understand that the, 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 the writer, which is, the, which is Moses, and he's writing in the Torah, the Torah is beginning here. We see that Enoch walked. Walk means to move. God is a moving spirit. You got to move with God. You got to move with the plans of God. That means Enoch walk in the timing or he was in the timing of God for his life. Whatever God had for him at that moment, he did not become unsynchronized. He, he stays in sync with God. And, that, and that's how we walk with God. We stay in sync with God. We stay in the plan of God. How do we do that? We don't know. We don't have the mind of God, but the mind of God is revealed to us by his spirit. Therefore, we have the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost will get us back in line. If we get a little bit offbeat, the Holy Ghost will put us back in rhythm. Uh, God got a way of working with every last one of us. He can speak to you, and I, as, I, as I said earlier, he had different ways to speak to us, uh, even in our own lives, and he had different ways to speak to each one. But God will make his vision plain, and he will let you know when you're in his will. You will have a peace, as I said before, an impression. You have a peace upon you when you're in the will. You are, you'll have troubling in the spirit when you're not. And, it, and it's up to us to turn around and start walking uh, in the will and the plan of God. Enoch walked with God. And he was not, the Bible said, for God took him, meaning he didn't die. Uh, if, 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 if he was, that means they could tell you where he was buried. Nobody could buy. Enoch, Enoch put the, uh, please excuse me, please forgive me, for because I don't mean to sound, uh, facetious in any way, but, uh, and, and, and I don't want to, uh, cast any kind of negative, uh, vibe or anything out there, but, but Enoch, uh, and, and the children of God, I believe one day, uh, are going to give the morticians a hard time. I believe that we're going to cause, uh, 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 tombstone makers to go out of business, or let me just say hurt in their business. I believe that God is going to fix it, that it's going to be so many people that they don't get a chance to funeralize. Uh, so many of these people, they have funeralized. And the devil probably came to the funeral and rejoiced over the funeral. But I, I believe God fixed it for Enoch, and he's going to fix it for some of us, that God's going to get the last laugh. And that, so the devil and his demons can't come by your funeral and try to tell the rest of your loved one remaining, look at them laying there, all they did, and they believe God and they still die. Well, I believe God got some people he ain't going to even let die. The scripture tell us 
that some would not even taste them dead. We see that Enoch was one that didn't. So I believe that some of us, even if you're not living this year, maybe I'm not talking to that generation, but I do believe that at some point this will be heard by somebody. And, and the Holy Spirit is talking to you and telling you, you ain't going to die. Now, I don't know who that is, and I can't tell you, and I'm not trying to push it off on you, but somebody is going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and they're not going to taste of death. For God took him, the Bible said. Now, I want to say this to you. I want to ask you this question, a couple of questions. Was Enoch life a bed of roses? Because he walked with God, was, was it a bed of roses? Did everything go his way all the time? You got to understand when it comes to God's way, uh, it's not going to hit your way all the time because the Bible said his ways are not our ways and our thoughts are not his thoughts. <clears throat> and therefore, sometimes we can be in our human form of thinking and we can miss God. I want to help you today because uh, you can think that you are wrong and you can be right. And you can think that you are right and you can be wrong. And that's why you have to trust God to order your every step. So the question I have for you today was Enoch, life a bed of roses? Or let me make it personal. Have your life been a bed of roses since you started walking with God? Now, I do understand that, 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 that before we walk with God, yes, uh, it shouldn't be a bed of roses, but let me help you out. Uh, children of the living God understand that the devil makes the road easy for those he already got going down the wrong highway. So he's not going to fight you. You're not going to have a fight from the enemy. He's going to give you short-term blessings, things that he has stolen, his hot goods. He's going to cause you to feel like you're in, a, in heaven on earth because that's all the heaven you're going to experience. But when you come to God and you start living for the Lord, and I believe I got a witness that sometimes you find that after you start living for God and walking with him, your questions come to your mind. Lord, what have I done wrong? Is it something I'm not doing? Are you not pleased with me? Am I yet saved? A lot of things the devil will start throwing at you. It'll make you question your own walk with God. But can I talk to you up in here? We finna standardize this faith. We finna show you how to, how to do this process through the word of God. And, and since we understand that our life had been a bit of roses since we're walking with God, Enoch's life couldn't have been a bit of roses either. So let's investigate. Here's another question I have for you. Did he have a lot of friends supporting his walk of faith? That question I'm asking about Enoch is actually, I want you to put yourself in that position of Enoch, and I'm asking you that question, brother and sister Enoch. Do you have a lot of friends supporting you in your walk of faith? I found out when you really, really walk with God, and I want to I wanna say this uh, before I forget it. When you really, really, really walk with God, a lot of times you'll find that the uh, closer you get to God, the further you get away from friends. For some strange reason, and I believe it's because of what we find when Jesus took his disciples up on the mountain, and the Bible said it was the mountain where Jesus was transfigured. When God is getting ready to do some transitioning, uh, sometime if you walk with him, you're not going to be in a whole large crowd. Because God is not going to carry everybody up where he's carrying you, especially if you have been walking with him in such a way that is unlike anybody else that walked with him. So the question is, do you have a lot of friends that are rallying around you and supporting you in your walk of faith? Was, was Enoch surrounded by prayer warriors and intercessors uh, and intercession from other believers? Did Enoch have that support structure that so many of us, that if we don't have it, we start getting down and we start feeling like uh, don't nobody love us and the church is not there for us and, and people ain't people don't love no more like they used to. Uh, what, what am, or what am I, am, am I the black sheep or what did I do wrong? Or, uh, just because you don't have a lot of friends, I feel like giving up. Baby, hold on, listen to me. If you understand what I'm asking you, I'm asking you, are you really walking with standardized faith? In other words, these answers to these questions is going to determine whether your faith has been standardized. He wasn't surrounded by a lot of prayer warriors. The Bible never speaks of the people that was around him and surrounding him. The only one that the Bible cannot, hallelujah, speaks of that was with him was the one who mattered the most. Can I tell you something right now? Just because 
you got a lot of people around you saying they love you. If God don't approve of you, then no matter what man say, it don't even count. Now let's flip that thing now. Now you might have a lot of people around you that do not agree with your life and the things you do and how you believe and what you say. But let me talk to you right now and tell you something. If everybody turn against you and everybody call you a liar and everybody hate your guts and don't nobody really understand you and everybody persecute you, if God be for, hallelujah, if God be for you. Now you tell me, you answer this question according to the word of God, who can be against you? For the Paul said, I am persuaded that I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. And I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor, nor things past, things present, things to come, nor any creature, not even an angel, is able to separate me from the love of God. Do you understand when you're walking with God, when you have this standardized faith, it's not about the people. It's not about the fanfare. It's not about a cheerleading squad. It's not about... Uh, support. It's not about people's love. It's about God's love. And when you hallelujah, and when you start walking with God, pray, praise his holy name. Sometimes you, you walk away from the fanfare. You walk away from the, the trail that God leads you. Can I just drop a little nugget on you right now? The Bible said that there was a man that he could not see. Uh, the scripture said that Jesus took the man to the outskirts away from the town. He took him away from everybody that knew he was blind. He led the blind man away from those that once led him. The one that he used to have to depend upon, that he ended up walking away from them. Why? Because he was walking with Jesus. Now he couldn't see. He had to walk by faith and not by sight because he was blind, remember? But as he walked, the Bible said they got to a point where Jesus spit on the ground. And the Bible said he touched his eye. Now, this is the way the walk with God works, is that when he touched his eye, the Bible said that he asked, he told him, uh, asked him, what do you see? He asked him what do you see. He looked around toward the town and the city, and he said, I see men like trees. They're walking around. The Bible said, this is, this is how God, I believe, did with Enoch. He kept walking with Enoch, and he kept touching Enoch. And that's what's going on with you today. That's what's been going on with you from 365 days ago before now, or let me just say uh, at the beginning of the year or whatever this year is completed, God is catching some of us at the end of it and saying, you done well with your walk. Some God is saying, hold on with your walk. And others of God saying, start walking right now. The thing about it, get your faith standardized because you got to get something solid, rock solid. And you got to have your mind made up. And you got to be positioned because the Bible tell us good that as he touched him once and he told him what he saw. The Lord did not stop right there. When you walk with God, God don't give up on you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? When you walk with God, God don't leave you half done. When you walk with God, God don't leave you in a state where you can't find your destiny. You can't find your purpose. You can't find your calling. You can't find your anointing. You can't find your power. God never leave you like that. What God will do is he have to. He'll keep touching you until you be able to say like the man, have the testimony that the man had. The Bible said that the man had, had been touched for the second time. He was walking with Jesus, y'all. And this is what happened. The Bible said when Jesus touched him again, he, the scripture said this way, he made him to look up. I believe you'll find that in Mark 7 or 8. He made him to look up, meaning that when, when God got ready to call Enoch into his place of destiny, he made Enoch come up off the ground. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Enoch couldn't stay here. It wasn't by choice anymore. He had walked with him so much so until he was on autopilot, which means God, when God got ready for him to start his aviation process, when he, when he got ready for him to start using his wings and fly away, God took the wheel and God was in control. And all Enoch had to do was ride the mighty high. I'm trying to tell y'all right now, though you're in this earth and though you're dealing with things on this earth, 
God is able, if you keep walking with him, he'll keep touching you. He'll keep touching you until the degree of the touch take you on out of here. What I mean, it'll take you out of that boxed in area in your mind. It'll take you out of that boxed in area that people have put you in. It'll take you out of stereotypes. It'll take you out of generational curses. It'll take you out of processes that are, that are digressing instead of progressing. It'll take you out of the, the mindset of your own ill will about yourself and your low self-esteem. It'll take you out from under the possession of the demons that come after the mind, the trouble, the spirit, and the heart to confuse you. If you just keep on walking with God and keep on letting him touch your eyes, after a while, he'll open your eyes not so much to the natural, but he'll open your eyes to the spirit realm. And the Bible said when he made the man look up, he said, I see all men clearly. See, in order for you to really be able to love everybody, you got to have standardized faith. In order for you to really be able to, to love your enemies, are you listening to me? You got to have standardized faith. In order for you to be able to make it through this dark season of the coronavirus, you got to have standardized faith. Now, I, 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 I got to say Enoch set the standard. By the way, he walked with God. In other words, he didn't have a lot of people walking with him, but he set his own standard. You got to understand, you got to get to a place where you decide, this is how I know in my spirit that I'm in relationship with God. You got to get to the point where you just rest in the Lord. You got to keep on walking with him until you finally realize, guess what? I thought I was doing the walking, but he was carrying me all along. Once you get to that point, you have a confidence. Then you start having peace that surpasses all understanding. Are you listening to me out there? So I want you to understand that Enoch had to set the pace. He had to set a standard by the way he walked with God for himself. In other words, the Bible said that Enoch had this testimony. And his testimony that he pleased God. Now was Enoch testifying of his own testimony, of his own self? He didn't have to because God <laughs> picked it up in his genealogy and he testified for him. He said, Enoch, walk with me. That's what God is saying. God is saying for some of you out there, I don't know who you are. You, 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 you didn't feel like it before you viewed this. You didn't, you didn't think about it probably that you were really the one that God has been testifying about. But I come to tell you, God testified about you. That's the reason why. The devil tried to come against you. That's the reason why. You had trouble in your home. That's the reason why. You had trouble on your job. That's the reason why. You had friends that lie on you and turn their back on you. That's the reason why. You start having some health issues, and I can prove it to you. That's the reason why. Sometimes even your spouse didn't understand you. Can I prove this to you? The Bible said that God has some angels, and we talked about angels last week, and they met up with, with the devil. And the Bible said that the angels start testifying. And when they testified, the man that they testified about was named Job. Job didn't have nothing to do with this conversation. My Bible tells me that, that God spoke through the angels and told the angels, tell Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. I come to tell you when God getting ready to transition you and when God getting ready to translate you, when God get ready to transport you when God get ready to transform you. God will allow some things to come your way just to prove to the enemy you're worthy of the next level. Are you listening to what I'm trying to say in here? Is that God is saying today through his word, when you see trouble, don't lose faith. Don't lose heart. When you see a dark hour, when you see plagues, that don't mean you're going to die in Egypt. The plague is so you can get up out of Egypt. Are you listening to me out there? You got to have standardized faith when you don't understand and know and see and, and be able to relate to the season that you're in. You got to know that God is for you and not against you. So as we look at Enoch, you got to come to a place of maturity as he did and he set his own standard. And that was he believed. Remember, remember, remember that the Bible said in Hebrews 11 and 6, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But 11 and 5 said Enoch's testimony was he pleased God. So how did he be able to testify that he pleased God? Well, Enoch did something that most people may not understand. But they may have done it or they may have not. And that is the first thing. Enoch 
was not delegated, but dedicated. And it's a difference between being delegated and dedicated. Enoch didn't delegate himself for no promotion in God. But Enoch dedicated himself to God. Again, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now, Enoch said he pleased him, and he didn't have to testify. So somebody said it for Enoch, just like the angels said it for Job. For he that cometh to God, the scripture said, must believe that he is. Enoch set a standard for his life. He couldn't see God, but he started living his life like he knew God was right there. All right, are you listening to me? He couldn't feel God, I'm sure, at times, but Enoch still lived his life like God was touching him even when he couldn't feel him. Enoch was so dedicated to walking with God that just his dedication to walk with God, to be in relationship with God, it pleased God. That don't mean Enoch was perfect. You got to understand, Enoch had a forefather and a foremother that you and I had that Jesus had to come and die for us so that we could have a blood transfusion. In other words, Enoch had the same mom and daddy we have called Adam and Eve. So it wasn't that Enoch was a perfect man, but it was the fact that Enoch was a dedicated soul. Now, the name Enoch means dedicated. Are right, y'all listening to me out there? In other words, you may not have the name that your mama or your daddy gave you or your auntie or grandmama gave you or somebody in the family gave you named Enoch. But I come to tell you, if you're dedicated, you might as well call yourself Enoch today. If you've been holding on to God's unchanging hand, you might as well call yourself Enoch. If you've been going to and tossed with this and that, but yet and still your soul has been anchored in the will and the way of God and the word of God. Go ahead and call yourself Enoch today because heaven is testifying of who you are and your works. Heaven is declaring who you are. And can I tell you what makes you more like Enoch than ever before through your dedication is that in your dedication, you can detect when somebody is just delegated and not dedicated. The Bible said in Jude Jude chapter 1, Verse number five, it reads, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Verse number eight said, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defiled the flesh, despised dominion, and speak evil of dignitaries. You can look at people that are delegated and not dedicated. They don't last long in the place that God intends for them. Plus, while they're there, they only create a problem and they become more of a liability than an asset and they are mixed in with those that are supposed to be in the kingdom. Are you listening to what I'm saying? All right? So they will speak evil of people that are in authority. They always got a gripe and a complaint with somebody in leadership. They always got a problem with the Sunday school teacher or the prayer leader or the choir leader or the choir director or the musician or the, or the deacon or the deacon got a problem with the, with the trustees or the trustees got a problem. It's always something. These are delegated but not dedicated. And when something come along, they hit the highway. They always get hot. They can't get along with nobody. I ain't talking about you if I ain't talking about you. But I'm talking about you looking up in your face talking about you if it fits you. But I'm talking to somebody today that's dedicated. And you've been dealing with folks that's just delegated. And because they've been delegated, it's been aggravating. It's been aggravating your spirit. Watch this. Verse number 12 says, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. In other words, they're sitting up there eating the word, getting the same message that you're getting, getting the same teaching that you're getting, but they're not putting faith in there. And the fear is the reverence of Almighty God. To understand that God ain't no joke. And if you're going to walk with him, you got to walk straight up real. you got to be honest, even if you're not perfect. you got to be repentant. Clouds they are, the scripture said, without water. Meaning that they come over like they've got living water. But actually, they ain't nothing but a dark cloud. And you know, a dark cloud don't do nothing for you. It take away the sunlight. If it ain't going to rain, if, if, if it wouldn't rain, at least it will put some water there on your plant, what you got planted. But when it's just a dark cloud, it blocks the sun. It ain't giving no rain. It blocks the sun. The sun is what the plants need in order to grow. So when you got dark clouds in, on the body of Christ, they don't win souls to Christ. The only thing they do is make more proselytes like themselves. 
And they called the house to be filled with more dark clouds. And it keeps the house from growing. It keeps the people from growing. It'll keep you from being able to grow in the grace of God. But the Bible said clouds they are without water carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering star. They ain't got nothing stable in their life. Wandering star. To whom is reserved the blackness of of darkness forever. Verse number 14 blew me away. When I read verse number 14 in conjunction with this text, I saw something here that really got me. Verse 14 said, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. I, wait a minute. You telling me that Enoch start prophesying. Oh, yes, he did. How did he do that? Well, first of all, he prophesied the same way he testified. Well, okay, tell me, how did he testify? He didn't have to say a mumbling word. Mm -hmm. But his works spoke for him. So whenever his works was righteous, for every unrighteous work, that's the reason why so many people have a problem with you. And you ain't even said nothing to them and you ain't got on their case. They don't even want you right. They always got an issue with you. They say you, you think that you this and you think you that. But the actual truth is that they don't think much of themselves. Therefore, they think you think like they think, but you don't think like they think because they're not walking with God like you're walking with God. Can I help you out right here? In other words, your works show, they sh show them up and bring shame on them. they jealous of you. That's what it is. Your walk with God has made them jealous. They don't have standardized faith. They got wavering faith. In other words, it's wandering faith. They can't set themselves down. They can't be rooted. But God said for you that are, for those of you that are dedicated, for those of you that are not just delegated, for those of you that are intended on keeping your hands in God's hands, no matter whether Corona come or not, it hasn't changed your position. It hasn't changed your outlook on God. It hasn't changed your faith. You still believe that God is a protector. You still believe that God is a healer. Watch this. And at this hour, we're being able to see how many people were just delegated. In this hour, you see how many people really have strong faith. In this hour, you can tell how many people are really walking with God. Those that are really walking with God, they may take some precautions to protect some other people, but at the same rate, they don't walk around scared trying to keep up with the numbers of the death total. They're not worried about whether, whether, whether this job opened up or that job opened up. They look and say, well, God took care of me all these many years, even before there was a coronavirus. So God is able to continue to take care of me. Am I preaching to somebody out there? And, and, and your works and your life and the way you walk around and the way you carry yourself, it testifies. But at the same time, it prophesies. And it says that God is going to separate the wheat from the tear. There's going to be some things that happen that's going to separate the wheat from the tear. They're going to look for you and you're not going to be in that, in that, in that garden with the tear. God is going to pull you up. Take you up out of that. I come to tell you, he's already done it for some of us. Some of you out there that are listening to me right now, and I got to get through. But some of you out there that are listening to me right now, God has already plucked you up out of the midst of those that once were your pre-corona friends. I come to tell you now, some of them don't even talk to you because they think you crazy. But listen to me. Don't worry about them. Just go ahead and be kind to them. I saw one of my sisters, Sister Angela Abram. I'm, I'm shooting this towards you. Is that when you sent your, your, your message out, it was a good message. Some believe this way, some believe that way. But let's everybody love and be kind. Can I tell you something? I ain't trying to change your belief. But one thing I found out about standardized faith, you ain't finna change mine. Enoch got in a point and a place where he set a standard for his faith. And it's got to be based, watch this, off the word of God. Listen what he said. The Bible said Enoch prophesied about these wandering stars. Now, he said to execute judgment, God is coming back with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all or convict all that they that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches. In other words, they hard talk, the way they talk so mean. And how they have talked, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. They have said to him some, some other stuff. There ain't no God. And God is this and God ain't that. 
All these ugly things that's been said. God, God is telling us that Enoch's life prophesied. God, Enoch saw something in his day and his spirit was grieved with it. Enoch saw the same thing you see right now. Can I give you some more? And we're getting up out of here. Enoch has such a close walk with God until his living testimony prophesied the coming judgment of the Lord that by the way he was spared from the judgment. You got to look at this. Is that in every season, God passes a judgment. He does that at so every so many days, years, months. I, don't, I can't tell you exactly. Only thing I can let you know is that there is always a shield. God will always bring about a shift. And before a shift, it'll be a whole lot of things going on that's out of the norm, kind of like what we have now. But in that shift, God spares his people and he pulls them out of the way of whatever the enemy might try to get an advantage in that hour. But those that are not solid in God, those that are not repentant, those that are not given their heart totally to God, and for those that have not standardized their faith, they have been wavering and now they get caught without the covering. So standardization, watch this, standardization refers to the practice of maintaining some level of consistency in the product, this is from a business standpoint, in the product or service that a company provides. Again, standardization, listen to this, we're gonna tie this in and we're done. Standardization refers to the practice of maintaining some level of consistency. Again, Enoch standardized his walk with God. He standardized his life. What he got to a level of consistency. You know how sometime up, sometime down, sometime in, sometime out, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. I'm a joy, Peter Paul mind. Whatever. I, the thing about it is that you gotta get to some some consistency in your life, and you have to have a standard set, and you have to have some guideline, you have to have some root. Watch this. A company wants to produce a consistent product so consumers will know what they're buying. In other words, God wanted us to be the product, or let me just say, for us to produce a fruit that when somebody come to our tree that are in dark times and in need, they can find what they're looking for. This is the hour that the church need to be, the church that has people that are walking with God and the church walking with standardized faith and the standardization of their faith is based off the scriptures so that in every season they can yield a fruit, not be one that's brought out of Egypt, but yet still doubt God in the transition and the wilderness and die. Okay, watch this. God has spoken to my heart and he's told me, he said that the people that he has brought out of the world, some of them have disappointed him. He has not been pleased totally with all. And the reason why is because they have put more focus on the virus than they did on the healer. And this is what God told me. He said in his word, he has never ever told none of his children, not a one of his children, not in any generation that he ever had to focus on death or disease. He never put in the word, put your mind on disease, on sickness, on death. Matter of fact, he said, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of a good report, if they're being in virtue, if they're being in praise, he said, think on these things. The Bible tells us that a man thinketh, so is he. The scripture tells us good and well that we are to set our affections on things above and not on this earth where Christ sits. So I want to encourage you today. Get your mind back. Get your mind back on track. Get your, get, your, get your mind in a consistent place where you can always look at God and see God in everything. Hear me, hear me what I'm saying. In this pandemic, I see God. And I want to encourage you what I see God in. In this pandemic, this pandemic has nothing to do with spiritual life or spiritual death, but it can produce spiritual life or it can produce spiritual death. But it's mostly about physical death and about physical fear and about carnal fear. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So, therefore, God is saying the pandemic really don't have the power to cross the line of your spiritual walk with him. 
It don't have the power. It don't have the sanction. It don't have the right of passage unless you let it come in. In other words, when you stop walking with God, stop focusing on God, let your relationship with God get slack or just start, just start getting to where you just focusing on you and what you're not able to do and how you're not, you can't take care of your family. I got, no, 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 no. You pray, baby. When you pray, pray in faith and leave it at God's feet. I promise you, God will answer your prayer. I got to get through. I got to get through. I could preach all day, but I got I to gotta finish this thing because I feel good right now. And I want you to understand that even in a time like this, the church is going to produce its fruit. We're going to produce. I'm preaching to you until you start yielding fruit. Not yielding to what you see, not yielding to what you've heard, not getting caught up in the distress that the world is getting caught up. I'm going to preach you out of that. I want to standardize your faith because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So to standardize something is to make it fit a certain guideline or requirement. You got to get your life to the place where it fit the word. It fit God's intended will. It fit God's way. It fit how God wanted to be so you can have what God wants you to have. Can I tell you something? God may want you during the pandemic to buy a brand new house. God may want you during the pandemic to get a new job. God may want you during the pandemic to get better health because you'll start taking care of yourself a little better, praying and asking God to heal you. God may be setting, uh, standardizing your faith, and you didn't even know it, through a dark time. Are you listening to me? He's setting guidelines for the future. He's setting guidelines. He said, watch this. We know cleanliness is next to God in this. We understand God not a nasty God. So God said, I don't want my saints to be walking around nasty, all spitting in one another's face. That's, God said, greet another with a holy kiss, not a holy spit. In other words, God wants us to be clean in. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Businesses do this so there's a corporate level of consistency, meaning no matter what church you go in, it's kind of like Walmart. You should be able to go in one Walmart, they done changed it up now, but you should be able to go in one Walmart you used to when Mr. Sam Walton was over it. You could go in one Walmart and find the same stuff in that Walmart and another Walmart. You could go down this aisle and it'd be on the same aisle. You go on this side, it would be on the same side. It was a standardized way of doing business in Walmart. God wants his church to be standardized. Why? Because we need a level of consistency and reliability of the product and services rented to its consumers or God's consumers. Meaning that first and foremost, God said, I want my church to be a light. I want my people to make a difference. I want you to walk in faith. I want you to hold on to me. I want you to trust my ways. I want you to trust me in a season that you can't see. You don't understand. When is it going to end? Don't worry about that. He said, just walk with me. If you walk with me, there won't be no end like you think. There'll be a beginning like you never dreamed. Now watch this. Enoch has standardized his faith through experience of trusting God. Now I want to say this before I go any further. Enoch produced something. It didn't please man, <laughs> but it pleased God. Now, hold up. I want to say this. In order for a business to really have the standardization set and all, how they do it is that they want to bring a corporate level of consistency. So they set guidelines and pass it across the bar. That's what they've been doing on your job. And everybody got to do this. Okay. When everybody do this, guess what? It helps the produce or the productivity. It causes everybody to have a set rule. You can perform this. It's been tested. It's been tried. It's been proven. And now it is established. That's the way your walk should be with God by now. It's been tested. You've been tested for faith. You've gone through some things. You've been through some ups. You've been through some downs. But it's been proven that God has always been there and he's always brought you out. You've had some stuff happen in your family. You've had some stuff happen on your job. But God always with you. Now, you have a standardized mindset about God. Therefore, it will cause a standardized faith in God and it will produce the kind of fruit that, watch this, that even if man don't appreciate your walk with God, that fruit will be fruit to God. 
even if it ain't fruit to man. Can I talk to you right now? You'll begin to produce something that when God comes to you, he's satisfied. I'm going to give you something right quick that the Bible said that Jesus was walking with his disciples one day and they were on their way to the temple. And the scripture said that when he came, he saw a fig tree or fall. The Bible said that he looked happily as though he might find figs and went toward the tree. The scripture said when he got close to the tree, listen, that's something not standardized, something that's not the same as every other fig tree that ever been produced on the earth, something that's wavered, something that's offset, perverted, not like it should be. This one fig tree this, it, it, it's different than all the other fig trees, and when he get to the fig tree, it's called a fig tree, but ain't no figs on it. It ain't nothing but leaves. Matter of fact, when a fig tree in Palestine will begin to bud, it's leaves, the leaves and the bud for the fruit come on simultaneously. There got to be a simultaneous both walk with God and then the evidence on the outside that you're walking in the love of God and that when people come your way, they can get, receive God. They can receive something from God and oh my God, that they can look at your life and they can say, well, you know what? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt they ain't told me it's something different about them because their life is testifying. I see they don't curse like the other person cursed. I see they don't hang around that kind of stuff that other to do like the rest of them on the job so their life is prophesying that these are wrong. So can I just talk to y'all and when I get up out of here I'm going to go is that you got to set and standardize your faith through the experiences by trusting and believing that God is going to reward you for your type of walk and relationship with him in some kind of special kind way. You got to know God is going to be good to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? You got to know because the enemy will try to make you give up your walk or get slack or get tired or, get, or just begin to feel like you ain't getting nowhere. But can I help you right now and tell you this? And I got to go is that he had to open his mouth and speak, even though he didn't understand what he was going through. Enoch had to testify to God. He had to talk to God. He had to communicate with God. Something he said to God. I'm telling you, you don't see nobody else walking with him but God. It's something that Enoch said to God that made God talk back to him and say, I'm finna bless you. I come to tell somebody right now, maybe you've been too busy, maybe Corona been in your ears and the news cast has been talking, but can I talk? I got some news for you. This is coming straight out of heaven. This just in. God said that if you keep walking with him and keep talking to him like you've been talking with him, loving on him like you've been loving on him, him allowed by you to love on you, you are letting him have his way in your life. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be good to you. I'm going to spare you from the evil to come. And some people may not understand, even if you leave this earth, sometimes God heal you on earth. And sometimes God heal you out of earth. Either way, God is going to be good to you. God ain't finna turn his back on you. Are y'all with me in this house? I got the clothes. I got the clothes. This is my clothes. My question is, is everyone that say they're saved <laughs> and read their Bible, are they really pleasing God? I'm going to wrap it up with this. The Bible said that in two places, we find one in Exodus. And we also find in 1 Corinthians. First and next to us is Moses. God tell Moses, I need you to go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses start talking about all the things that are wrong. You'll find this if you begin to look with him. Exodus 4, verses 10 through 14 talks about the conversation, the dialogue, his talk, his talk to God, agitated God, because his talk was saying, I'm not dedicated to your plan. Moses was saying, but, but I can't talk plain. I'm not, I don't, I'm not an eloquent speaker. Uh, uh, and and I, if I go tell, tell him who could send me. And, 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 and he was just one thing after another. God had dealt with him from Exodus chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 4. Now the Bible said that the Lord began to become angry. He got angry with Moses. And the Bible said the anger of the Lord in verse 14 was kindled against Moses. And he said, there they are. There you Levite, there your brother. I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet you. And when he see thee, he will be glad in his heart. In other words, God said, I'm going to give you, because you ain't want to walk by faith, you got to walk another walk. Now you're going to have Aaron walking with you. And if you read your Bible, you understand, sometimes it's better to walk alone, because Aaron was some of the problem that Moses had to carry. He was a weight 
The Bible said, let us lay aside every weight and sin so either will set us and let us run our race with patience that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, that's the only one you need to be focusing on, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. I'm trying to tell you how to standardize your faith. Now the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm closing. I promise you I'm closing. I'm just bringing one point home. Is that the scripture said that I want to remind you, brethren, Paul talked to the church of Corinth, how all of our fathers came under the cloud. But it was, it was simply this. They were all baptized in the same sea. And they all drank the spiritual drink and ate the spiritual, same spiritual meat. And they drank from that same spiritual rock that followed them, which is Christ. But many of them was not well, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. But let me tell you something. All these things in verse 11 happened unto them for example that it was written before time that let us know how God thinks. Wherefore, we need to understand clearly if you think you stand, you need to take heed lest at any time you fall. Walking with God is not arrogance. Walking with God is just confidence. When you lean on the Lord, God will assure you that he's with you. Now, do you want to be God's friend in your lifetime? James 2, 21 through 23 gives us the account of Abraham and how that Abraham had faith and works put together. And the Bible said in verse number 23, and the scripture was filled, which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. I believe Enoch was God's friend. You know, because you can't have somebody you call your friend and they don't never please you. After a while, you're going to start saying, they used to be my friend, and now they acted like my enemy. But today is the day that your faith will be standardized. How are you going to do it? I'm going to do it, first of all, because or through the fact that I'm going to walk with God. Why am I going to do it? Because... Jesus had already paved the way and made it possible that I can have a relationship with God. How did he do it? Well, he went on that cross. He bled, he suffered, he died. He gave of himself. When will he begin to walk with me? As soon as you turn from every evil way, repent of all of your sin, ask him to be Lord of your life, and then ask him to fill you with his spirit to guide you. When will he return? That's a question that I cannot answer. Will he return? That's a question I can tell you. Definitely he will. How you will go, I don't know how you're going. Where you will go, if you give your life to Jesus, you're going to be with him. And as long as you're walking with him now, you're going to continue to walk. The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if you're walking now, you're going to walk right up there with him when you meet him. I can just imagine some of you today you may not have thought about walking with God. You may not have had a standardized faith, but I want to lead you in a prayer of faith. Can we go in prayer now? Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for those that have received it. I ask, Father, that as they pray with me now, that they will open their mouths and repeat after me. Dear Lord, I acknowledge all of my fault. I thank you that you are the savior of the world. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. I praise you and I lift you up that you have given me a chance to see and to hear what I have witnessed and what I have heard this day. I thank you, God, that this word was for me. And I ask you, Father, to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord, come in my life. Whatever's left, take it and use it. I want you to be the head of my life from now on. I want to walk with you. I want my faith consistent. I don't want to be wavered. And for those of you that are backslider, and you're ready to come back home, or one that you just fell in and out, let's talk to God. Father, I pray for stability. Come on, in my life, keep me. I want to be kept. I need to be kept. I don't want to digress. I don't want to miss my season. I don't want to repeat cycles. Lord, come in my life. Bless me to walk, progress, move, transition from one place of destiny to the next place of destiny 
on time in sync in Jesus' name. Now, for those of you that may already be saved, you may already be walking with God, I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that I have no bragging rights of my own to declare that I have done anything well enough to deserve a relationship to walk with you. But God, I do thank you that you've dealt with my heart and my mind. God, I pray for those that want to make it, and I pray for those that want to have their faith standardized. We intercede with them because the highway that leads to destruction is broad, but the one that leads to eternal life is narrow and only a few find it. We pray that they will find it today, God. We intercede for them. Even though Enoch didn't have anybody else walking with him, God, we are the body of Christ now. So we're the New Testament church. We want to walk with you and please you. And one thing we want, God, is for our brethren and sisters to please you too. Help us all, God, to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a, a new viewer, I want you to know that we want you to continue connecting with us. There's, there's going to be a, um, a, a page that you can see, a website page that you can contact us. We want you to know you can be our e-member. You can be our member by electronic. East Fernwood, e-member. You can be our e-member. Contact us. Let us know what you got going on in your life, how we can be able to uh, assist to you through prayer, and, and, and we can contact you, reach, reach out to you. Uh, you don't have to go through what you're going through all alone. Uh, somebody will be here to pray with you. Somebody will talk to you. Somebody, somebody loves you. And know that God loves you. He loves you more than anybody on earth can. But we love you too. And we thank you so very much. And may God continue to bless you. In Jesus' name. Until we meet again.